Hey, Emily. Hey, Stephanie. You uh, want to do a podcast? Absolutely. Welcome to Cycle Chats, a podcast to destigmatize what it means to be a woman. This is episode 30, a celebration of creativity, where we talk to a lady who looks great in a bandana. She loves mushrooms, cats, pirates, and foam. A finalist on NBC's Making It, Kara Walker. Welcome, Kara. I am so excited. That's the funniest description of myself. And I'm like, wow, I've never been described in that way. But is it pretty accurate? Right? I, you know, so for those of you who don't know who Kara is, you can go and watch NBC's Making It and probably fall in love with her like I did. So I am a huge fan of Making It. I think it's just a really beautiful competition that doesn't seem like a competition. It's just weird people that have found their way together in a space and creating things and helping one another. And it's just so warm and lovely. And I've watched from the beginning and I remember watching your season and just like, there was something about it. And I think it was Amy who asked you the question of what advice would you give your 15 year old self? And I was like, oh, okay. I think this is the universe telling me that I need to invite her on the show, but I never in a million years would have actually thought that you would respond to me. So thank you. I'm I'm baffled that you're even here and that I'm sitting across from you. That's so funny because I respond to everyone who messages me. Like, why not? Like, it's not like millions of people. <laughs> I have the time. I love that too, because, you know, so often we see with social media, somebody gets too big for their britches and they don't want to have that conversation. And I just think that's such a, you know, you're closing the door to being able to like branch out and meet other people and create a community. And especially with what you do, I am in love to be able to talk to other people. And like, if someone's like, Hey, I love this thing that you did for you to message back. Sometimes it just makes someone's day, even if it's a little thing, like, I don't know. It made, it made mine. It, it made it yours. You called me. You're like, I, oh, I think I may have cried a little bit. I just because as Steph's saying, I, I think people just get kind of overwhelmed and then they don't respond back. But it's just somebody feels connection with you over a TV and they may not be able to get back to you based on their followers and their lifestyle. So I, I'm so appreciative that you actually took the time to message me back. Oh, no problem. Anyone can message me. I will message you that. I'm awesome. <laughs> and I think you know what I think it was more so your story. I think that's, I mean, for me, that's what was the exciting part when Emily's like, guess who we got on the show. And when I listened to your story, it was very touching and it showed vulnerability. It showed strength. It showed sense of self. And that's kind of what this podcast is, is show up as you are, as weird as you are, as, as quirky, whatever you want to be, show up as you and let's embrace that. So I, that was very inspiring for me to see that and to be able to have you come on. I was like, all right, cool, man. I'm excited. This lady, I cried. I'm not going to lie. I cried. I mean, I cry at like commercials. I cried. I was like, oh my God. So crying like every 10 minutes on that show. I'm like, oh my gosh, I have never cried so much in my entire life. And they were just like poking at me like this. That's what they wanted. They, yeah. I think that got on the show was my bad story. Because, you know, we're all kind of stereotyped and, you know, I had to be like the broken one that art saved, you know, so I kind of feel that niche. But yeah, there's so much crying. And too, because we filmed during COVID. So everyone was like used to being alone. And then now we're thrown back into the art scene again. So it was like therapy for all the makers. It was just like, just gushing these feelings. Like I have not cried about my childhood in 20 years until that show. And now I can't even talk about it without getting all getting choked up. Listen, Amy Poehler and Nick Offernan can now put on their resume, professional therapist. We'll send them a certificate in the mail. Be like, congratulations. You passed the board. You did it. You made it. You made it. <laughs> there you go. So I'm assuming most people don't know who you are. So can you explain a little bit about who you are and what you do, even though we just gave a little bit of background? Who am I? Good question. Uh, constantly changing. Like next week, I'll probably be a different person than I am today. 
because I believe that you just constantly have to be like learning new things. If you don't, you're just going to shrivel up and die. So like my goal, like how, hmm, now I'm starting to stutter. I get too much going in my head. Just like get it out in a smooth, comprehensible way. <laughs> you're talking to the queen of it. So please, you're amongst friends here. We totally get it. I tell myself I want to learn a new skill set, like something major every year. And so I feel like that's really helped me know as much as I do by now, because I've been doing that for 20 years and I learn more than one thing a year. So that's why I can do so much. And I don't know how to do any of it. I'm making it all up. So when people are like, oh, you're a professional, let me ask you a question. I'm like, I'm really not, but I'll tell you my best guess. And I'll tell you how I did that wrong and how you can like not do what I did. Because I look super smart on the show. Like, oh yeah, it's just, you know, a little kung fu phone magic. But it's like, they did not show you how messy I am. Like the workspace was just annihilated. I'm pretty sure my footprints are still on the barn floor. That is awesome. So what made you want to get into this maker's field? It was all pure accident. I didn't know that I was like crafty or artistic until I was like 16. And my parents took me to Oregon to visit my grandparents in the summer. And you know, girls that age, that's the last thing they want to do is like, well, I don't know, some girls want to be in the woods. I did not. California girl did not want to be there. And my grandfather was a painter and he had a little studio. And I said, hey, can I try it? Like... He's like, yeah, okay. And so he did oil paint. So I went to the store and like those Latin paintings were really popular then where it's like a whale above the water and under the water. So I got a card, like killer whales doing that thing. And so I went in there and I came out and I pretty much had copied it. And I still have it too. And uh, my whole family just looked at me like, what? Like your first painting. And I just like copied it. And it, it, it just clicked in my head. And then my whole life changed. Like for Christmas, everyone was giving me paint and I was obsessed with it. And yeah, that was really the start. And then I just kept painting, was selling paintings to my teachers in high school. And then I went to community college for like two years for a graphic design. And then I realized that I think I'm going to die if I have to sit in front of a computer because it's just not my nature. And then I started painting murals and then someone told me, you know, you can make good money doing this. I'm like, really? And then, so I started doing that and then people were booking me and I told my mom, um, cause you know, I was living at home with my mom at that time. Cause I was 19 and I'm like, you know, let's just give this a shot. Let me try turn it into a business. I can always go back to school. It's not going anywhere. Well, it took off instantly and I was full booked six months in advance and just hit the ground running. And so I've only worked for myself since I was 19 years old. That's so cool. Did you find that painting, I know it was something that was very lucrative for you, but did you find that there was a healing component to it? Because I'm a makeup artist and when I do makeup, I find that I'm, it's a therapy for me. So did you kind of discover that as you started to go along in the painting process? I definitely like a best where if I don't make stuff, I will just die. And to the point where I ignore my children. <laughs> you just go do you. Don't burn the house down. I had to even go make some stuff. And they totally get that. And so they understand what's happening. And, you know, so. And are they creative at all, Kara? Are you finding? My youngest, Jet, he has it. He has that spark. And so every time I'm working, he wants to come out and do something. So I set him up with some clay. I'm like, here, why don't you? do something and we can make a mold and I'm trying to teach her well you know the silicone's gonna go in this hole so you gotta fill up that spot and you gotta you know so he's into it dash has it but he's an 11 year old boy so he's sucked into video games so I'm hoping maybe later in life well that's awesome that like he gets to do that with mom because passion is such a beautiful thing and like Steph said she's a makeup artist but we're both actors and like when you find that thing that just kind of works. It, it finally clicks and you get to then share it with, you know, for, we don't have kids yet, but I have nieces. And what I get to share that with my nieces, that love of theater or my love of female empowerment with them. It's just so immensely like, it just feels like the warmest hug is the best way that I think I can express it. it it's so lovely to share that experience that you have with the people that you love. 
Yeah, definitely. And I try to really encourage them with the artistic thing. I like to remind them, like, I was not exposed to everything the way that they are. You know, I had to learn, like, I didn't learn homework till my 40s or late 30s. And I keep telling Jet, like, you can learn all this very young. Imagine how good you will be because you have all of these resources that I never had. Like, I think if I would have known all of the options artistically at a younger age, I would have steered more in a different direction. My life would be completely different. I personally believe that when you learn those things and you're making it up as you go and you're just figuring it out and no one's teaching you, I feel like that is what makes really, really good art, but really good teachers. So in a way, I think it's great that that's how you learned because now you get to guide your son to be like, hey, this is some of the older school way of doing things, but it's a way of doing it that's never going to go out of style because I think trends are constantly changing. And so, you know, tomorrow it's going to be some other little gadget that can do this thing for you and it takes the guesswork out of it. But you learned with your hands. I just think it's so important not to rely on the trendy stuff and to really rely on the, the foundational things, which which is by hand doing things with, you know, simplicity and not getting too crazy with it. So I think in a way it's, it made you as good as you are to be able to also teach your son to do it. I mean, just a different way of looking at it too. Right. And it is true. I'm very hands-on, like almost the old school way before we did everything with computers and cricket machines. Like I have a cricket. I've used it twice. I don't know what to do. It's a thing. What inspires your designs? Oh, everything. It's like a problem. I could be like just sitting, talking to somebody about something and they'll say one key word. My brain just left. It went somewhere else. It made something from start to finish, like totally problem solved the whole thing, source material. And then I come back to what they said and then I hang up and like, cool, new project, gotta go. It does not end. Like it's just everything will be like, oh, that's really cool. But here's how I could make it better. Like I'm not gonna reinvent the wheel. If it's already been done, I don't need to do that. So if I can buy it, the way I want it, cool, I'll just do that. But oftentimes what I'm looking for doesn't exist. And that's what inspires what I make. I want to make what no one else makes. What's your favorite thing to make then? I have a favorite, but I definitely have artist ADD. That's for sure. Like I could be into something like right now, it's like all things mushroom. And it's just like, okay, well this battle will go out and there'll be something else. But it's like, I, I just booked a big job doing some giant mushrooms and stuff for a company. So it's like, oh, I'm your girl. So I didn't know that you have had your business that you have created since 19. I mean, to be your own boss at that age, what was that like? What have you learned? Well, I never had a real job before, so I didn't have anything to compare it to. So it was just, this is what it is. And we're making it happen. I was definitely a more shy person back then. Like my mom had to force me to get out of the car, take my portfolio into an interior design shop and show them my stuff. Like if you're going to get jobs, you have to put yourself out there. Like I don't want to. I cold called everybody. I just took pictures of my work. I said, hey, this is what I do. And they were so shocked that I just walked in there just off the street. And that's how I built my business. But there was no Pinterest. There was no any of that back then, no social media. So yeah, I had to work the pavement and go to different towns and contractors and be like, this is what I can do. And it just slowly grew and grew into like, so it started with murals. And then I realized, okay, this is a very niche market. If I want this to like sustain itself, I'm going to need to learn more. So then I taught myself faux finishing on walls. And then I taught myself cabinet refinishing and countertop epoxy before it was cool like it is now. I was doing this 12 years ago. I just think that's really freaking cool, man. I mean, like you knew what you wanted and then you went and you got it. And that's, that's really hard for some people to, to do right. And to follow a passion. That's really scary. Like the amount of people that when I'm like, I'm an actor, they look at me and they're like, Ooh, they give me the look and like the sigh, like there's something wrong with me because it's not something that fits what they think is the right job, the nine to five. 
but I'm like, well, it doesn't have to work for you. It has to work for me. So I, I just, you know, I give you all the props because to know that at 19 and to be like, yeah, no, this is what I'm going to do. And I'm going to make my money from doing this. Well, it's good and bad because it's like, it's feast or famine. Like there's no stability to it. You know, it's like when the housing market crashed in 2008, my husband had left his job working for Lockheed Martin to come work with me because I was so busy, I couldn't handle it. And the housing market came. And I'll be honest, we had to file bankruptcy. Like it hurt us big time because no one was doing house stuff anymore. And so he went back to his old job and I still have been doing my thing. And so it's very like this. And so it's like the best and the worst because it's all on you. But you know, I, I'm ruined. I probably could never go to an employer. Like I'd be like, wait, you're telling me I have to be here at nine o'clock no yeah I I tried like we worked at a children's theater and that was good because I feel like there was some leeway with it but then I tried to do a traditional nine to five and was like this is awful I just there was no ifs ands or buts about it you are either built for it or you're not I was like so sure I was going to be able to make the transition but I'm like no freaking way man I'd rather take the pay cut and not have the consistency than ever feel like my soul is being sucked out of every orifice in my body like it was not great at all so I I feel that I think it's rewarding though if you love what you do yes it is stressful it is feast or famine but it's a feast or famine you're like semi-comfortable with you have like an agreement with it you're like you know what though I'm being fulfilled in another way so it doesn't feel so chaotically heavy for me at least that's how it's been when I do then get a job I'll have low periods and then I'll get you know a couple makeup jobs in a row and I'm like oh yeah this is why I'm doing this like it's it's worth it I'll never stop like like, oh are you planning for retirement retirement what are you talking about like I'm not gonna stop doing this I could win the lottery and not have to work again and still be making things because I just can't not do that. (laughs) It's what I do. I could not agree more. What advice would you give to other makers who are starting out or who have been in it a while and are finding kind of a plateau point or just advice in general? Yeah, I mean, just based on my own experience. So if you like only put yourself in a tiny little box, you need to have room for growth. You gotta like expand, know as much as you can. Don't be scared to try. Because I notice every time I'm scared of something, it turns out awesome. It's when I'm too confident that everything goes wrong. I always tell that to my kids. I'm a a teacher at a college level. And, you know, I'm always like, I find that the things that you're usually scared of are the things that you guys need to work on. And while that's very scary for them to understand because it's behind the door and they're like, I don't want to open it. The monster's on the other side. It's the things that we need to work on and we're putting the boundary up because we're just, we're, we're scared and that's okay. But as long as you can say there is room for growth and I can face the monster, that's awesome. So we were talking about you being your own boss and being a woman and being your own boss. What did that bring up? Like, did you face a lot of scrutiny based on just being a woman who owned her own business, who was showing up for herself? I think you'll be surprised at this answer that dealing with men contractors, I'm used to job sites, great. Everything, awesome. My biggest issue I've had on a job was with a woman and I don't know what her deal was with me, but she would just treat me so terrible and all the other people on the job was just like what's your deal with you I'm like I do not know I don't know if it was a jealousy issue or what but I realized she would not treat me this way if I was a man I was always a bit of a tomboy when I was younger And I think as I got older, and again, this is not like a, I'm going to toot my own horn. But as I got older, I realized, oh, a lot of that was insecurity. And I think unfortunately in society, women are taught to be pit against one another. In theater, Emily and I are no stranger to, well, if you don't want this role, there's 15 other girls that are waiting to, you know, get it. And so it's this competition within the competition. And it's very strange. Yeah, definitely. 
That's what I like about the maker community is I feel like everyone is rooting for everyone to succeed. And I feel like I have learned so much because I reached out to other makers who knew more than me and they were nice enough to answer my message on Instagram and be like, oh, this is how I would do this. Like they helped me grow. If they wouldn't have taken that call, I wouldn't be where I am now. And it's just, I really like that I appreciate it like I had one guy who was trying to make a mold and my first time I like, posting pictures of it on Facebook and so some guy like like hey let me tell you how to do that can I talk on the phone with you and so he's like telling me how to do it and as he's talking I am realizing that he is the artist that sculpted and made the Iron Man suit like the Iron Man and put Robert Downey in the suit I was on the phone with him and he was telling me how to make molds and I'm like oh my god this is insane he's like oh yeah come to my shop and so you know we randomly he follows me on instagram he comments on my stuff it's like it's so freaking cool how you know social media has allowed us to connect to other artists that i didn't get that when i was younger i was solo and so i'm used to not having friends i still don't have friends in real life so i just hang out in my shop and all my social is through the internet but that's so cool though because you know we're spread out everywhere and we can still chat every day and it's so cool. That was the thing that drew me besides Amy Poehler, who I'm obsessed with and Nick Offerman, who, you know, I just want to shake his hand, but like besides watching, making it because of them and because of them hosting together, the minute that you start watching the show, you just feel this sense of like freedom from all of you and beauty and self-acceptance and then acceptance of others. And I don't honestly think there's any other show like it because as I was saying way before in the episode, the competition, because it is, it's a competition. Somebody wins at the end. I don't feel like that's the aim. Like it is, but at the same time as a viewer watching it, I was just watching your connections and like the artwork that you were creating. And it just blew my mind that people are able to help one another and say, Hey, you know, maybe I could help you do this or whatever it may be, or even trying something new on that show, which was, is always mind blowing. I'm like, Oh my God, they're trying something new. And then I get anxiety for them. Uh, but like, it's just, it's such a beautiful way that I wish the world was more like because even in this podcasting world, you know, there's other podcasts out there. There's other women empowerment podcasts and you don't see that a lot. Like, yes, there are people that, you know, double tap to, you know, support and stuff, but I don't think people actually understand how much and that means to creatives, to makers. That double tap is the difference between them getting a deal with somebody and like starting to make money or them starting to become more visible. So like, and it's not even that it's even sharing or like talking about it. Word of mouth, like we talked about earlier is so huge. And I don't know why people aren't willing to step up and support one another. It's, it's very mind blowing to me because I don't have that mindset. I want to support everybody by either double tapping or, or sharing if I can, you know, if you're trying to change the narrative and put good in the world and put positivity out there, I feel like that should be rewarded, but that's not always the way that people see it. So that show is, is just such a happy place for me. I'll rewatch it a thousand times just to have in the background because it makes me smile. Right, that show, it really is exactly what she said. There was no competition between us all. We were there for the experience, didn't matter what happened. And it's just like, it really was about sharing. Everyone was like, oh, you got this, you got that. And oh yeah, it was great. I really want to go back so badly. I was really surprised that the show focused so much on the makers and kind of them personally, as much as what they were making. I do wish that they showed more of the process of us making things, maybe less interviews with the makers, because it is called making it. It was more like interview with the maker, but I think it would be great because there were so many cool moments of things that I did. I'm like, oh, cool. A camera's watching. They got this good material. They didn't show any of my best moments. And I was just like devastated. I gave you gold. 
go. That's probably where the the TV part of it comes in is because they were looking for the the heart piece. How can we pull the audience? You know, and you could look at that one of two ways, right? You can look at it as like for for people like Emily and myself. Like I love either or, but I know that I'm a big heartstring person. So you pull the right heartstring and I'm yours forever. And then you've got your side of it where you're like, dude, I got all these, this cool ish that I did that, you know, the camera was on me and you weren't showing it. And, you know, and that's, that's maybe what you should petition for. Be like, release the footage. We want to see all the cool stuff that I did. Cause I'm in, I'll sign up. Emily will sign up. But as far as what you were able to create on the show, do you feel like that you brought your best work to the show? Do you feel like it presented you well? Uh, no. Those time frames were small. I'm used to my own time frame. And I did not like being presented in that way. It's like not something that I would give to a client. This is not a finished product, but yet we only had nine hours. And so, you know, I so I totally had a meltdown. They had to like take me out of the barn, calm me down, like the whole thing. I totally lost it. So one of the other things that I definitely want to bring up, because it was one of the things that pulled me to you. And like you said, you've never cried so much. And I'm sure under extreme circumstances, right, when you're filming a TV show, things are just happening. And it's so much moving pieces around you that you're just getting whipped up. And and that's why The Bachelor works and, you know, all of that. The one thing that, you know, Yes, Amy asked you, you know, what you would say to your 15 year old self. And I was like, ding, ding, ding. But the other thing was the idea of you growing up with the golden hair syndrome, right? That's the right way to pronounce. It's been hard. Yeah. My husband had a stroke when he was three years old. I don't know if I've ever said this on the podcast, but he had a stroke when he was three and he is paralysis on the left side of his body. He walks with a little bit of a limp. And I remember our first date and he didn't tell me that he had any of this. So when I met him, I wasn't expecting that. So it was a learning experience for me during that first date. I remember him like having to lift up his arm and put it on the bar and like all of this stuff. And I was like, is this going to be the thing that stops me from loving this human? And it just really touched me that you also grew up because I, and I'll cry if I really think about it, but him growing up with something that somebody is going to call a disability or a deformity, right? Is like, he had to deal with that. And I'm sure he was bullied. And like, we've spoken about it and on all of that. So how was it like growing up for you? Because I'm as a woman, we are scrutinized even more than men and to grow up with something that people don't understand or they see and they're like, Oh, my God, what was that for you? I was very fortunate in that I was never bullied. You know, I had like two girlfriends growing up through grade school the whole time and that's all I needed and it was fine. And then I discovered painting and I just, you know, dove into that. So I didn't really have issues with that part, but yeah, it's just the hiding yourself, you know, because of, I didn't wear my hair up like I do now until I was 20 years old never wore a ponytail because I did not want to be seen and then I finally realized that like I said on the show I'm just stealing my own joy me not wearing it up or down or whatever is not going to change the fact it is what it is so stop caring and and I did I was still in community college and I put my hair up for the first time and I went the world didn't end like look at that And so I was just like, okay, I'm done. I'm tired of hiding myself. I mean, I was so extreme that like when the wind would blow, I would in junior high hold my hair down to my face because I didn't want to be seen. And I feel so bad for myself. Like I was, it sucked. It sucked big time. I have curly, very large curly hair. And I wanted to hide that version of myself for 20 years. I straightened my hair because I didn't want to be that person. I wanted to look like everybody else. I didn't want to be bullied for looking different. And I think as a woman and as a girl that age, it's just, it's hard. It's hard. Nobody can like really explain to you how difficult it's going to be, but I'm so glad, you know, like I found my joy through acting is where I really was able to step into my self-confidence because I was able to portray other people that may have had more confidence than I had and take that confidence into myself. So I'm assuming for you, it's the same thing with crafting. You just were like, I'm really good at this. So I'm going to take my confidence from being so good at this that nobody else can stop me. 
Yeah, I think that definitely probably played into it a lot. I wonder what I would have become if I didn't find art, you know, to give me that confidence to kind of push me along. Because it, it's, it's a growing process. Just everything in life is just learning about everything else and it's just self-acceptance. It's like, who freaking cares? Like, I tell my boys, like, oh, but this is all... Nobody cares. Do what you want to do. You're going to create your own happiness. No one's going to make it happen for you. So sitting on your butt is going to get you absolutely nowhere. One of my favorite quotes that I say time and time again, and it came from my lips one night to my ears, and I couldn't believe that I even believed it and said it out loud was, I am the creator of my own destiny and I choose my happiness. And so you can choose to look at things differently. And that's not to say, you know, woo woo, toxic positivity, but you can choose to go, you know what, I'm going to do something that's really scary. I'm going to go towards the fear and I'm going to prove to my insecurities, to my anxieties, to my fear center, to my lizard brain, that what you're saying, you're trying to keep me safe and comfortable. Thank you. I appreciate that. But there's nothing to be afraid of here. And I'm going to show that to you. You eventually kind of get to a point where you're like, I'm going to choose to be happy now. I'm going to stop making decisions based on this weird idea that like, this is what other people want for me. So, and you came from a family of artists. I think you would have found art anyway. Honestly, it, it seems like that was an inevitability. The way that you speak about it is so like you were meant for it. You know how you meet people who you just know this person was meant to do this thing. I think that's you. I think it was in the cards. Like the universe had a plan. They're like this one. This one's going to create some <laughs> bad art. So I truly believe that eventually you would have found it. And I, I don't know. I'd like to think everything happens for a reason. You just kind of good, bad, and in between. Yeah. But you can choose to change the trajectory of it. So if you're saying, oh, well, it's all happening for me. Okay. The stuff that happened happened for a reason. Learn from it. And now, if you want to change your life, you have to take the steps to change it. There's different doors. Choose which one you want to open. Yeah, for sure. We can totally change your life at any moment. You just have to be willing to do it. So, what does women empowerment mean to you? I think you just got to just rely on yourself. Don't worry about anyone else. Just do what makes you happy because you can't expect anyone to fix you or to bring your happiness. It has to come from yourself. And it took me 40 years to get there. And, you know, I'm so glad I did, though. I mean, I'd be sad to think that I was still stuck in that tiny little box and didn't let myself just be everything I wanted to be. And I don't know, just stop caring. Who cares? <laughs> Who cares what anybody says? Just do your thing. Don't apologize for it. And just do it because there's going to be other people that like what you do. And stop trying to convince people. I was like, I build for my own happiness. No one else's. I make a huge Halloween display. If nobody saw it, I would still put it up just for myself. Like I, when I first built it, I was so happy that I sat on the curb in front of the neighbor's house with my wine and just looked at it for like an hour. And then my son would come out and we would just sit there and we would just look at it like, isn't it dreamy? And it's just like, oh, it's just beautiful. And it's just like, it fulfilled everything that I needed. I was like, I got to keep doing this. And I'm so happy that one thing that I've just realized that came out of this whole COVID crap is I haven't been on a job site in like a year and a half. Like I've been home making what I like to make and not listening to the, these other people and having to make what they want. I get to do what I want and those other people that want it too. And so it's so cool. So I, I always remind myself, like when I feel like overwhelmed, like, oh, I got to go do this. It's like, no, it's a mindset. I get to do this. I get to go out to my own shop and have my little kitty cat sitting on my desk and carve with clay. And it's just really mental is a lot of it. You just have to like, how lucky are we? It's like, we get to do things that other people only dream of. And it's, it's very special. And I have to tell myself every day, just like, no, you don't have to do this. You get to do this. This is a privilege and recognize that. So then my last question for you, and 
I am not stealing this from Amy Poehler. I'm going to say that Amy Poehler stole this question from me. What advice would you give your 15 year old self? Everything's going to be fine. Like, don't, don't you worry. Just keep doing what you're doing and move forward. And it, it's going to be fine. Yeah. I think we all needed to hear that at 15. Yeah. I mean, I tell myself that now at 30, I'm like, everything is going to be fine. Yeah. And all those cool kids in high school, they're not cool. Once you leave, Oh my God, no, you don't Absolutely even not. worry about it at all. You're not going to be everybody's cup of tea, but that's okay because some people don't like tea. Oh, there's this thing that I read and it was, what was it? It was like, bees do not explain to flies why honey tastes better than It's like people of this lower vibration that are like negative people, don't waste your time trying to convince them, you know, that honey's better than It just is. Don't waste your time with them move on to people and do that. And I think people also come from a place of like, I often tell myself when someone's being mean, sometimes they're just a-holes. That's very possible. But sometimes there's a deeper reason why they're behaving that way. And unless they want to look in the mirror to fix that, it's not your responsibility. You are not responsible to clean their mirror so that they can see what they need to fix that's on them give them the rag give them the spray tell them you know what you might want to tidy up that mirror and then walk away because now it's in their hands you can there's only so much you can do you can't force somebody to want to change so i think it's important to always be aware of someone might be going through something don't take it on as your own give them good wishes well wishes i hope for the best and then move on you know and Sometimes people are just jerks and also coming to the grips that like sometimes people just suck. That's okay too. You know, you're not them. You don't have to be them. Whew. Thank goodness. You know, that's, that's what I tell myself. I'm like, oh, man, I don't have to be you, thankfully. Wow. So my question though, because I, well, we know where we found you, but where can people find you? and DM you and reach out to you. Cause we've been saying that this whole, just please reach out to her. Where can they find you? And do you have any fun projects coming up that we should keep our peepers open for? Absolutely. So you can find me at uh, Carol Walker designs on Instagram. Yep, message me. I'll message you back. Uh, if you want to learn foam, I'll help you. I'll tell you where to do it and how to do it and everything. And coming up, if you're in California, in like the LA area, I'll have a booth with all my goodies for sale at a Midsummer Scream. So I'll be doing that at the end of July. And then I have my website, carawalkerdesigns.com. And I only have a few things on there, but I have a ton of stuff in my shop that I need to finish and get on the site. But yeah, everything's growing and changing and everything's looking up. Oh, thank you so much for taking time to talk to us. It's really, it's nice to finally put all of the, from the TV to now the computer screen, it's nice to be able to connect and to get to know a little bit more about who you are, what you stand for and what you do. And I just appreciate your art. And I'm so thankful that at 16, you picked up a paintbrush. That's all I'm going to say. I, I appreciate it so much. <laughs> like I said, and I'll say it again. Never in a million years, I reach out to so many people that I have a feeling are never going to reach back out to me just because it's a small podcast and we're still growing and learning. And But the fact that you actually took your time to reach back out to me and agree to doing this is, this is a dream come true for me. So thank you a million times. <laughs> I hope you can edit this, okay? I ramble so much and it's like, ah. Oh. I'm not a speaker at all. So I'm like, oh, don't say anything stupid. Well, we're going to wrap it up here. I just want to thank everyone who's listening. And if you are new to the podcast, welcome. You can find out more about us at our website, cyclechats.com, where we have a blog and a community of our lovely cycle cats. So reach out, interact with us. We love to interact back. And we sincerely appreciate Tara for taking your time to be with us today. And we appreciate everybody taking a little bit of time out of their day to support and to love on us. You guys are amazing and we hope you sync up with us next time. 